Good morning, everyone. I trust that you're doing well and that you're knowing the Lord's help and blessing. Uh, I'm going to begin by praying this uh, this morning. Uh, and I, as I do, uh, I want to particularly remember a, a situation that's arisen in our, our local community. Um, a young man who has attended our church gatherings many times over the years, um, including not not so long ago, really, a few weeks, I suppose, um, has gone missing. And uh, the police are, are looking for him. His family is distraught. And um, it's another reminder of the uh, massive need that we face in this area. And uh, just a, a word, quite detached from everything I'm going to, to say, but uh, a word of encouragement. These are the reasons not to leave, but these are the reasons to stay. And these are the reasons, if you are watching from somewhere further afield, these are the reasons not to stay away, but indeed to consider moving into our area, into our community, to be a part of uh, a missional force for uh, kingdom impact in our community. Indeed, there are many places like this that you could go to, but uh, the invitation is always there. We need the Lord's help, but we also need the service of his people. Let's pray, and then I'm going to read from Zechariah chapter 5. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning asking that we would know the reality of our most recent sermon from Zechariah, um, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. How we need the Holy Spirit. We need you to work in us. We need you to equip us and to empower us. We need you to keep our, our, our hearts clean and our minds clear. We, we need you to anchor us to Jesus Christ. We are battered by so many forces on all sides, spiritual and earthly. And we pray, O oh God, that you would hold us fast. Lord, we intercede this morning on behalf of the Andrews family and uh, particularly young Trayvon, we pray that you would draw near to all of them. We pray that you would convict him in his heart of uh, the, the path that he has chosen to go down, the way of which is destruction. We pray, Lord God, that you would bring him home. And we pray, Father, that even as you bring him home to his family, we pray that you would bring him home to you. Lord, I pray for the men of our church that you would stir up within them not only um, um, a, a passing interest in this uh, social predicament, but uh, a zeal and an urgency to take such young men, to identify them and to take them under their wing, to uh, mentor them, to help them, to Pour into them, even as the scriptures say, the older men uh, discipling the, the younger men. And there, there, Lord, there are women in our uh, uh, community as well in no different situation, but oftentimes uh, less easy to spot for one reason or the other. And we pray that the same would be true of our sisters, that they would, uh, within the church and um, from the church to others in the community, that they would be seeking those whom they can disciple and care for. And we pray, Father, that you would turn uh, the hearts of these young people to yourself in repentance and faith. And we pray, Lord God, that you would help us as a church uh, that, that finds ourselves so often awash in these issues to, uh, to engage meaningfully and directly with these people in a way that is helpful and uh, brings sustainable, authentic, Christ-centered life change. Help us now, Lord, as we learn from your word. For it is by your word and your spirit 
that we will be equipped. In Jesus' name, amen. Zechariah chapter 5, and I'm going to read from verse 1. Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? I answered, I see a a flying scroll, and its length is 20 cubits, and its width 10 cubits. Then he said to me, This is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. And it shall remain in his house And consume it, both timber and stones. May the the Lord bless the, the reading of his word. This morning I want to speak to you on the subject, flying curses and the forgiving Christ. What is your understanding of Curses. What is what, what? What comes to mind when you think of a curse? Perhaps your mind goes to uh, to children's stories, children's stories, and yet um, we're we're talking about curses and uh, evil, gross, ugly-looking old women stirring pots and um, uttering incantations. Not exactly child-friendly stuff, but. You know what I'm talking about. And yet, the, the curses of uh, Disney have their roots in curses of mythology. And uh, the curses of mythology have their roots in actual curses practiced by uh, pagans and uh, idolaters throughout human history. This week, I thought I would do one of those dangerous Google searches. And uh, I, I, as soon as I did, I, I regretted it. I clicked one link and I saw what I needed to see. And then I just felt like now I'm going to be getting ads for amulets and uh, you know charm bags and all sorts of witchcraft stuff. But uh, uh, I, I, I clicked through to the first link that came up, which was for eBay. And it was someone selling um, uh, uh, several, uh, all new, so they're always producing these things, herbal charm mojo bags, curse breaking. And, uh, and then the, the other keywords that they just put in the title were folk magic, witchcraft, conjure, jinx, and hex. They're selling these little baggies for 35 pounds. And uh, I quote from the advert, genuine intentional curses and jinxes are very rare. However, sometimes others can hex us unintentionally, often through jealousy or anger. If you are experiencing a run of bad luck or accidents, this could be the cause. This powerful magic charm bag contains traditional ingredients designed to remove and ward against any curse, whether deliberately cast or not, including the famous evil eye. It will deflect all negativity directed towards you and return it back to the sender. It is individually crafted to order by a professional wise woman with over 20 years' experience. And then the uh, sort of testimonial from the uh, uh, woman making the ad says, I am a traditional cunning practitioner or wise woman with over 20 years experience in the magical arts. 
I provide powerful, magical, and spiritual services based on the practices and mysticism of old Britain and Europe, popularly known as cunning craft. Similar things in our own local area of Woodgreen reflect less the ancient paganism of Europe, as did this advert, and more the ancient paganism of the global south. Men and women can often be found up and down Woodgreen High Street distributing cards, advertising services purportedly able to protect us from black magic and to lift curses. Perhaps you have unwittingly been recipient of just such a card or seen one lying on the pavement. Various charms can also readily be seen across our city. Some are are simply decorative or are souvenirs from holidays, but there are plenty of people who really believe in them. Worn by people hanging on doorsteps, placed in windows or on car dashboards. In our area, the most common is normally a handmade glass ornament with concentric circles or teardrop shapes. You know know the one. You may even have picked one up whilst uh, uh, on a trip to uh, Turkey or some such place. Uh, Dark blue, and then a circle of white, and then a circle of light blue, and right in the middle, um, a, a black circle. And these are called Nazars, and they are used by many of uh, the, the cultures represented even in our church and local community to ward off the curse of the evil eye. Uh, you may also, as I have from time to time, seem, uh, uh, seen lemons on a, uh, a string with chilies. Is that familiar at all? It's um, uh, popular in South Asian, particularly Indian culture. Uh, It is um, called a nimbu murchi and is strung up by Hindus to protect houses from the evil goddess of misfortune, a Lakshmi, who, if she is let into the house, will bring ruin and devastation. Now that I've mentioned it, you might see them more string with lemons, dried out, and chilies. Now, the reason people are seeking protection from curses is because, well, they're worried about curses. All kinds of curses. Some are individual, personal. Some are generational. Some can be broken easily enough, but others seem practically unbreakable to those who believe that they are under them. More than once, many times, either on Woodgreen High Road or uh, over the phones, uh, some desperate individual will be um, calling or uh, stopping by uh, our book table to chat and uh, the subject of a curse that they feel they are under will come up. And I remember one phone call where this person was desperately venting, uh, pouring themselves out about this curse that they felt they were under. And uh, it did not matter how much I pointed them to hope and how much I pointed them to the very answers that I'm about to give you, they, they, they could not get past that they were under this curse and they said that there was, there was, you know, there was no hope for them. There was no chance for them. So I was wondering, why did they even call? They wanted to get it off their chest, but they left with the curse still over them or the thought that they were under a curse still over them. And it was a ter- such a terrible Desperate place to be in mentally and emotionally. The thing about these curses is that they not only have a negative impact on those who are receiving them, but they are generally bad things with evil origins. Either wicked deities in a pantheon of gods and goddesses that aren't particularly loving, evil spirits, or demonic entities. And these curses, bad, evil, wicked, unjust curses with evil origins, satanic, demonic origins, are 
place upon innocent people. I don't know, uh, perhaps you resonate with some of what I've said. Perhaps uh, you are afraid of those type of things. Perhaps you maybe even yourself feel like you are under such a curse this morning. Or maybe you're dismissive of the whole concept. Whichever you are, this morning I have sobering news. There is a curse, at least one. And certainly one which you should fear more than any other. It is very real. But unlike the curses that so many people are are driven mad by, this is not an unrighteous curse. And it does not come from a wicked deity, evil spirit, or demonic entity. Rather, it is a totally righteous curse originating from the holy God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them and is worthy of our worship and praise. And this curse is placed by a holy God, a righteous curse placed by the holy God upon people who by every honest standard richly deserve it. I have two big things that I want you to see this morning. And the first is this, the curse. What can we learn about this curse from the text that we've just read? First of all, we see that the curse hangs over us. The curse hangs over us. Zechariah says again, he's still in, in, in this same night, an autumn night, uh, having a series of visions. An angel of the Lord is talking with him and is revealing things to him. And he lifts his eyes and he sees the sort of thing that you would, I suppose, only anticipate to see in a vision, a flying scroll. Now, we have come a long way from the time of scrolls. And while some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, I can no longer presume that everyone does. A scroll was uh, a, a document, the standard document at that time upon which people wrote things, normally made out of uh, papyrus, which is um, a, a paper formed out of um, a, a kind of reed, wood, and, and rolled up or made out of animal skins, um, uh, some sort of animal hide that's been stripped back and it's, it's been recorded on a scroll, is then rolled up. But when it's rolled out this way or this way, um, you're then able to, to read the contents of it. And, and, and so he sees a scroll flying, This is not normally the sort of thing that you see flying. And an angel who talks with him asks, what do you see? And I answered, I see a flying scroll. But he's more specific now. Its length is 20 cubits. And its width is 10 cubits. We don't tend to think, in the same way we don't think of scrolls anymore. We we think of books. Um, We don't think in cubits. Some of you think in feet, some of you think in meters. So we're looking, if you think in feet, at a 30 by 15 sign. Uh, A a billboard, basically, on the side of the road that's advertising some new cleaning product or film or housing or some random something or other. Uh, If you're thinking in terms of meters, it's nine and a bit meters by four and a half meters. Okay. So this massive scroll is flying through the air. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the dimensions that are stated, the 30 by 15, 9 by 4 and a half, 20 uh, by 10, are the same dimensions of the holy place, the room that was immediately before the entrance to the most holy place, the holy of holies in the ancient tabernacle. God instituted this as the original place of worship for the people of Israel as they were leaving the the land of Egypt and their time in slavery 
in that land. And there in the holy place, you had to walk through the holy place to get to the holy of holies. Only the priests could enter the holy place. And only the high priest could enter the holy of holies. And there in the holy of holies is the law. But the holy place was, uh, uh, was off limits to everyday people. So swooping down like a giant billboard across the land, the land this, this scroll reminds people of the holiness of God and the holy place that was designed to point people to a holy God. Uh, a, a pure place, a place of cleanness, of righteousness. And swooping down upon the nation, it pronounces judgment. To whom does it pronounce this judgment? Well, again, the text is very clear. Uh, verse 3, Then he said to me, This is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. So, again, we know that the curse hangs over us particularly over everyone who steals and everyone who swears falsely. Now perhaps you're like stealing, swearing falsely. Where do I fit into those two categories? Let's start with stealing. Stealing is one of those things that to most people in our relativist permissive age is still for the most part considered wrong. Across cultures and backgrounds, if you take something that doesn't belong to you, then the person, at least who is the victim, thinks it's wrong. And they're right to think it's wrong. That's something that is encoded into our conscience as people created in the image of God. And yet, while it is um, uh, still considered wrong of all of the things that Scripture says is wrong, if anything, the whole idea of stealing has become more complicated and opportunities to steal, even quite casually, even unthinkingly, are multiplied and more diverse in our day than they were even in the days of Zechariah. You can steal ideas. You can steal quotes, plagiarism. Um, you, you can steal intellectual and creative property, media, Photos, images, music, films, tweets, Facebook statuses, uh, you know, a whole range of things that is authentically stealing and wrong. Personal details, identities, so on and so forth. The, the list is, um, is great. But at the end of the day, stealing remains what it is always has been actively taking something that doesn't belong to you without consent or um, uh, and people often forget this passively not giving to someone what belongs to them from fair wages to the diligence owed your employer in your workplace to taxes owed the government to items or funds lent to you by someone that you never give back. Misusing something entrusted to you for a specific purpose, which is embezzlement. Taking advantage of someone by using their need and vulnerability along with your power and privilege to get what you want, knowing they will pay up however unfair you are being. That is extortion. Taking something from someone else by force and perhaps with violence, that is robbery. Using a person's involuntary or coerced services, non-consensually taking someone from their family, community, or such for the purposes of performing some work or service, really with or without pay, but uh, even with pay, it would be... Uh, inadequate and inappropriate pay that is slavery and exploitation. 
Limiting people's access to decent education, adequate accommodation, good opportunity, fair pay, health care, legal representation, enjoyment of individual rights, and participation in corporate responsibilities. That is oppression. All of these things are packed into the umbrella of theft. Stealing. Are we in this room or watching the broadcast blameless? You thought it was, you know, breaking it, smashing someone's car windows. And some of you would do that. Some of you have done that. Kicking in someone's door and running off with something. You've done that, maybe. You've thought about it. Can't, you know, just assume <laughs> That's not the world we, we, we live in. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us at some level have stolen. I remember seeing this advert. Uh, you might know the one. It was before uh, films. It was normally on DVDs or in the cinema. And it'd have, it'd have a sort of CCTV type footage where where someone, someone is breaking into someone's home and they're taking out a television. Not the TVs like we have uh, now. The TV that they're taking out is this big box type thing. And it's like, yeah, I don't, you definitely wouldn't steal that TV. But um, uh, it says you wouldn't, see, you wouldn't steal um, uh, this. And then it, it shows someone grabbing someone's bag. It says you wouldn't steal. And I remember always watching that and always thinking... No, I'm pretty sure that some of the people watching this would, would do that and have done that. And then the point, obviously, it's making is about movie piracy. Uh, so there are so many things that people do that are stealing individually. And then, I mean, it only becomes worse when we think uh, uh, corporately, nationally. What about the nation in which we live, which... We have made our home or into which we were born. Has it not pillaged and plundered the wealth of nations over many centuries? And did it not become Great Britain at other people's expense? And yet we would surely look in vain to find any nation on the face of the earth that was blameless in this matter. So even if we who have made this place our home were to return to our homelands to look at them, we would find ourselves dissatisfied. I I think of my nation, the United States of America. It must have come as news to the people who had dwelt there for millennia that it was only just discovered in 1492 or whenever it was. And then to see it slowly carved away in some places, swiftly conquered in others by people, some of whom engaged in their thieving in the name of God. Believing under Him, it was their manifest destiny to expand their dominion, political systems and economic structures across the continent. Is there anything that we have, really, that is untainted by theft? Anywhere that we come from that does not have the shadow of the flying scroll hanging over us with its condemnation? Same scroll, second side. It's a double-sided scroll, so you can see it from all angles. Just when you think the one, that you know, oh, it's past, it's over. And you look back and there's more on the other side. We read a curse on those who swear falsely. In other words, liars. And really, specific, a specific kind of liar. Th- those who would summon witnesses, threats, consequences, and all sorts to strengthen their lies not least in the wider cultural and scriptural context, those who would lie using God's name. For that is what it was to swear falsely 
most commonly in their day. As the Lord lives, God wills it in the name of the Lord, by God, as surely as there is a God in heaven, under heaven, God is my witness. Thus says the Lord, God told me. All of these are variations of the same concept. And yet, when someone swears falsely, they appeal to God. They appeal to heavenly authority for their dishonesty. In its most extreme form, we might think of King Saul of Israel, who um, said to his son Jonathan of his servant David, As the Lord lives, he shall not be slain. And a mere four verses later in that story, we read of him hurling a spear at David in hopes that he might impale him against the wall. As the Lord lives, he shall not be slain. And yet all the while, Saul intended to do precisely that. In more subtle forms, it is claiming that God is on your side to give your wrong behavior a sense of righteousness. I uh, mentioned the historic idea of manifest destiny a moment ago. Uh, the idea from my home nation, the United States, that developed in the uh, uh, mid-1800s. And uh, it, it, it was this idea that under God, a nation could be built on the backs of imported slaves and at the, exp at the expense of indigenous peoples. It was the manifest destiny of the European people to conquer this continent. Uh, this nation and the continent of Europe had a concept of their own. It was called the divine right of kings. And that asserted in the name of God that because kings derive their authority from God, they cannot and should not be held accountable by any other earthly authority, such as a parliament or council or spiritually the church or the uh, gathering of the people of the nation together. Uh, but because they, they have the divine right of kings, they can do whatever they want. They have authorization to oppress, to exploit to commit the thieving atrocities that I spoke about a moment ago. Conversely, the king or queen's word was considered as absolute. Thus, any other authority, whatever it may be, that of the church or that of a parliament or that of a democratic um, uh, gathering or union of people, must submit or comply to the highest authority, the king or the queen in, in those days, regardless of what is right or responsible or constraints of conscience and belief. Though this idea has had its day in our secular and democratic Western world, its impact continues in some way to this day and its influence remains, not least in the government's casual willingness to make demands as opposed to Re requests of the church and its resentful demeanor towards critique and wider social efforts toward accountability. And frankly, this has been the case regardless of who is in power, regardless of government. Down through the ages. Are we much better individually or nationally today? Churches are filled with people. Churches, never mind the nation, because that's low-hanging fruit. Churches are filled with people who claim divine revelations, utterances, prophetic words, all in the name of God. But these things contradict Scripture. And they pander to people's desires and ways of life. And they're often centered on personal success, political advantage, prosperous living, and personal desires instead of a righteous and holy God who is worthy of our worship and praise. 
There are preachers who prance about with obscene levels of self-absorption as though they represent God Himself, saying things as though they are God's representatives, but their words and their lives beg to differ. And of course, across society, people who believe in God, who are eager to pretend that God is on their side with the latest outrage that they have thought, said, or done. People who do not believe in God, but nonetheless, they find creative ways to emphasize what they are saying is true, even when it manifestly is not. And yet, maybe all of this is stuff that you can agree on. I don't know. Perhaps even that is still low-hanging fruit. To avoid this problem of Swearing falsely altogether, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37, you've heard it said of, to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. But be honest. Even with swearing falsely removed entirely from the equation, have you ever said yes and the answer was no? Have you ever said no and the answer was yes? We all have lied. And those who lie are definitionally liars. Even as we all have stolen and those who steal are thieves. Jeremiah, the prophet, wrote in Jeremiah 7, verses 8 through 11, Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, Baal being a false god, an idol, and go after other gods that you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered! Only to go on doing all of these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. So the spotlight is turned not simply on those outside, but on the people who say they belong to God. People who say, we have been delivered. We are delivered. We are saved. And yet he says, you're a den of thieves and liars. What we do, what we say, our sins against people, our sins against God. And the curse flies on. The curse hangs over us. But not only does the curse hang over us, secondly, we see worse still that the curse dwells with us. The text reads, verse 4, I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name, and it shall remain in his house. The phrase used here, remain in his house, is most commonly used of a uh, temporary stay. Not settling into a home, but more like staying a while at a hotel or in temporary accommodation. We have by our sins opened our doors to it. A historic way of understanding the terribly devastating extent of our sin is total depravity. Or radical depravity. Now if you can learn the technical terms for whatever discipline you practice, uh, I would encourage you to learn the technical terms, the language of the, uh, the, the beliefs that you hold to. 
Total depravity, radical depravity is an important term that communicates that we are polluted by sin in every aspect of our being. That is not to say that we are all as bad as we could be. But it is to say that we are not in any way as good as we should be. Everything is stained by sin. Sin is a part not only of what we do, but it is a part of who we are. To be very clear, we are not sinners because we sin. Adam and Eve were because they were made good. They were made fine. They were, they were perfect. They, they were all right. God said, they're very, he looked at them and he said, they are very good. But they sinned. They rebelled against God. The first man and first woman rebelled against God. They broke his one simple command and thereby they became sinners. But ever since then, we, we sin because we are sinners. That is, it's a part of our nature. Since sin brings a curse and sinners are inseparable from sin and we are all sinners, as Paul, quoting, in, quoting the Psalms in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, none is righteous, no, not one. If that is the case, then the curse is knocking at our door and it's bedding down for a stay. What does the curse do once it's inside? And that's the third thing we see about the curse from this text. The curse cleans us out. So, so the curse hangs over us, this, this scroll sweeping down over us, and it comes in for a landing, and it, 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 I don't even know if it's knocking at our door, it's kicking in our doors, and it's, it's making our house a temporary home, and it cleans us out. Like when something unwanted uh, invades your, your personal details and uh, gets into your bank account and you, you log in and there's nothing to be found there. Everyone who steals, the text reads, verse 3, everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side. And everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. And then going to the end of verse 4, once it enters the house, once it remains in his house, it shall consume it, both timber and stones. It's going to leave you dissatisfied and empty, and ultimately it's going to leave you dead. It's as though the stuff you've accumulated through theft and lies is sat in your flat and you get home to find it's all been repossessed and worse still, the house itself is falling apart. All that you've built is going to come to nothing. All that collectives of people, organizations, nations and so forth that they've built by theft and swearing falsely will come crashing down under this curse. Why? Because sin has so horribly affected us at the individual level and sin because it's affected each and every one of us at the individual and personal level it is built into the structures and systems that we have built the structures and systems of our lives jeremiah chapter 22 verse 13 talking about some of the sins that landed the people in exile out of which they are emerging when zechariah prophesies they left a heap of rubble behind them where once there had been a city. Jeremiah said, Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice, who makes his neighbor serve him for nothing and does not give him his wages. Shout out to my guy Samson reading his NLT this morning. Uh, the same translation, or is it a translation? We'll have to continue roasting our brother about that. Uh, says, the Lord said, What sorrow awaits Jehoiakim who builds his palace with forced labor. 
He builds injustice into its walls. Horrible translation, but it really gets to the meaning. So um, uh, you enjoy that, bro. But um, when, when injustice is built into the walls, God has to send in the curse to tear down the walls. And that's what happens here. It remains in the house and consumes it, both timber and stones. All our idolatry, all our immorality, all our injustice brings a curse. And what is that curse? Well, ultimately it is death. For the wages of sin is death. Where then is our hope? And that is the second thing that I want you to see. I've shown you the curse that's flying across the land. We've seen that the curse hangs over us, that the curse dwells with us, and that the curse cleans us out. But I, I cannot leave you with the curse this morning. And, and therefore I must look elsewhere somewhat beyond these verses. I have to show you the Christ. The wages of sin is death. Christ paid the wages. He dwelt with us. Because we, we read it in the Gospel according to John in the first chapter. The Word, the eternal Word, who was with God, who was God, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Very similar language to that which is used of this curse shall remain in his house. It was not a permanent stay. It was a temporary stay. But even as this curse has come into the house temporarily, Jesus came into our world temporarily. And, and coming into our world, the eternal Son of God dwelt among us. He pitched his tent alongside ours. He moved in briefly into temporary accommodations down the road and he dwelt among us and shared the human experience and lived this life so that he could represent us he dwelt with us he walked among us he talked with us we are told throughout the new testament uh, particularly the gospel accounts that jesus looked out upon us and he saw us as sheep without a shepherd and he had compassion upon us he sees us cowering under the curse. He sees us in a hostage situation in our homes where a curse has come inside and it's eating away at our lives, but we can't do anything about it. And he says, I've come to bring liberty to the captives. I've come to, to bring freedom to the prisoners. And so he comes into our life, into this hostage situation, and he takes the curse for us. He deals with the curse on our behalf. He represents us. But he could only do that if he dwelt with us. The curse dwells with us. The Christ dwelt with us. But not only does the Christ dwell with us, not only did the word become flesh and dwell among us, but we see also that the Christ was hung up for us. And he has to deal with the curse that's hanging over us. And so Galatians chapter 3 says that all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. If you are looking for freedom, if you are looking for forgiveness, if you are looking for the redemption of your souls and salvation eternally, if you are looking for holistic restoration in life, for, and for all eternity in the kingdom of God, then, 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 and you're trying to do that in your own power, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to sort myself out, I'm going to clean myself up, I'm going to stop stealing, I'm going to stop lying, I'm going to stop invoking God's name, and thereby His displeasure, when I'm calling on His name, and I don't really mean it, and um, I'm, I'm trying to get divine validation for my nonsense. You're under a curse because that's the law. You're trying to do it in your own power. You're trying to keep the law. But no amount of forward-looking keeping of the law can make up 
for the backward-looking violation of the law. And the fact of the matter is, even as you try to keep the law going forward and you try to do right and you try and be good and you try and clean yourself up in your own self, you will fail. You will mess up. You won't be perfect. It's written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Galatians 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. You will never stand right before God by the law. In your own righteousness, you need something different. You need something better. You need someone greater. Right now you stand like Joshua the high priest from Zechariah chapter 3 in the filth of your sin before a holy God with Satan accusing you and his accusations are right and just and true for a change. He's actually speaking the truth. And God is looking at you and he sees you in your filth. You need him to take away the filth and to clothe you in righteousness. But so long as you're trusting in the law, so long as you're looking to yourself and trusting in your own works, you will not have that righteousness. It is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. And so you're enslaved by the law. And you're trying to, to work through everything, all the minute of the law. And it's, you know, some, some of you have really probably tried hard to stick to the, um, the, the government rules and the government guidance and all of that for COVID-19 by hazarding a guess that every one of you have violated the, that law in some way or the other, unintentionally, or sometimes intentionally because of necessity. How much more so God's law? But here's the good news. Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming... A curse for us. Not becoming a curse over us, but by becoming a curse for us. As it is written, curse is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And so he became a curse for us hanging on the cross. Becoming a curse, becoming accursed, and suffering the righteous Justice and holy wrath of a good God so that you and I may go free. Colossians uh, chapter 2 verse 13 says, You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him because Jesus didn't say hanging on the cross. He went down into the grave and he is raised. He was raised on the third day to new life. And all of our trespasses are forgiven. And we're made alive together with the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And he's ended all of this by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Again, the curse flying over us. Saying, you're a liar. You're a thief. You swear falsely. You're under a curse. But... That's been canceled now. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. You see, for Jesus to be a curse, to be made a curse for us, he's the flying scroll. And he's nailed to the cross, but he gets down and the scroll stays up. And its ink is all blotted out by the blood of Jesus. And, and, and it's, it's uh, what, what makes it up, it's fabric is ruined and soiled by the blood of Jesus. And it's hanging on the cross. The price is paid. The penalty is satisfied. Justice is accomplished. God's wrath has been delivered. And all who trust in Jesus, no longer on the cross, no longer in the grave, but risen, ascended, and reigning forever as king, 
you can walk in that freedom and that assurance, in that forgiveness, in that redemption. He set it all aside. He set the curse aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities. He's not even talking about now divine curses. But demonic entities that would come against you and accuse you. Those things that I began with. Demonic entities, uh, wicked deities, spiritual forces that, who knows, maybe you feel like you're under that curse even. My friends, if you're trusting in Jesus, you are not. Nothing has a hold on you. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to, 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 to live in fear. The curse is gone. Jesus has sorted it out. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And, and that leads me to the, the third thing we see about the Christ. Not only do we see that he dwelt with us, not only do we see that he was hung up for us, but we see that he cleans us up. The curse cleans us out. It empties us. It leaves us dissatisfied. It corrodes and consumes and destroys and burns out and breaks down. But Jesus, he doesn't clean us out. He cleans us up. He washes us. He refreshes us. He renews us. He takes what was broken and he beautifies it and puts, it, uh, put, put, puts us back together and, and, and we're more beautiful and more valuable than we were before because we have Jesus and we're filled with the uh, power of the Holy Spirit to live new lives, clean lives, holy lives. The curse is taken far away. And I would say the things that the curse was calling out in our lives are removed continually by this spring of living water that's continually washing through us. And Jesus says, I will, I will create that in your heart if you come to me. Wellspring of living water, streams of living water to refresh you, to renew you, to revive you, to resuscitate you day by day. So every day you die to sin and every day you live to Christ and you know that you're alive with him. Friends, if you're trusting in Christ, you, don't, you have no reason to think you're under a curse and you have no reason to live like you're under one. Go and live in the joyful, holy, righteous liberty of Jesus doing what is right, doing justice, loving kindness, walking humbly with God, and walking in good fellowship with his people. But if you're not trusting in Christ, you might be wondering, well, where does that leave me? I'm not really, I'm, I don't really believe in Jesus. I'm not really trusting him. I'm not really following him or seeking him. I don't have any good news to give you this morning. There's a curse. And the curse flies on, and the curse still calls out through the ages against those who are thieves and liars, against those who steal and sin by what they do, and against those who swear falsely, who sin by what they say. Turn today to Jesus. Realize that you are polluted by sin but see how Christ has taken sins. And not only has he taken our sins, but he has taken our curse. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that was upon him has brought us peace. You can know that peace today if you call on Jesus, if you, if you call out to him now, Lord, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me. 
Pour out your heart to him now. Confess that you are a sinner and confess that he is the Savior. Lord Jesus, only you can save me. Only you can make me clean. Only you can represent me before God and and make me right with him. Only you can bring me to the Lord into right relationship with him and his people. Only you can take what's broken and restore it. Forgive me. Make me new. Fill me with your spirit. You can call upon him and we're told that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you can move on from the curse into the joyful experience and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let's pray just now. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would not live as those who are defined by the curse, but as those who are defined by Christ. Not by what we have done and by what we deserve, but by all that Christ has done and all that he has credited to our account in his goodness and grace. Father, I pray that this would be the day of salvation for people who view this sermon, that they would respond to this good news. And yes, Lord, that they would be afraid of the bad news if they're not yet trusting in you. Lord God, may we all turn from our sins. May we all continually commit ourselves to following Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.